very basic in our thinking is that we, as it say, one must live. We need to survive, to go on. We need, therefore, money for food, for this, that and the other. We must go on. And we know that we're not going to get away with it for very long. That after a certain number of years we're going to die. The, the, the thing is going to end. The thing that we call I is going to be as it is in sleep. Deep sleep with no dreams. But that between now and that happening there may be the most ghastly pains. Not only perhaps the pains of physical disease or being wounded or hurt, but the pains of worrying about our failure of responsibility to people who depend on us. And we suffer other people's suffering simply because we're sensitive and have imagination and participate in their sufferings and our adrenaline and our chemicals respond simply by imagination to the sufferings of other people. And what about that? And so we can look at these problems and say, now, quite obviously, all these problems cannot be solved in a physical way. That is to say, we do not expect in our lifetime that medical skill will make us exempt from death. We do not seriously expect that human beings will all learn to be nice to each other and will refrain from war and horrors of that kind, racial prejudice and so on. We don't seriously expect to find a method of being protected by taking some sort of drug against all possible disease and pain. So therefore we say, now maybe there's another way around. Maybe that instead of solving these problems at the technical level, we could solve them at the psychological and spiritual level by so disciplining ourselves, by so doing something with ourselves, that we wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. And so, in accord with that motivation, we seek out spiritual teachers, psychological teachers, this, that and the other. Could we somehow be made over so that we don't worry about the quaking mess by a spiritual discipline or whatever. <clears throat> and you see, if you examine that, that this wanting to overcome the quaking mess and not have it anymore, that precisely is the quaking mess. The thing that we object to about ourselves is precisely what we do about overcoming it. In other words, the activity that we employ in overcoming it is the mess that we object to. Do you see that? And it's very important to realize that. And if you do realize it, you raise the question, then what can I do? What can I do to transform the quaking mess into the state of mind of the true mystic? Well, if you are the quaking mess, there is obviously nothing you can do to transform yourself into the state of mind which you are simply manifestations of the quaking mess trying to get away from itself. And that you are put in the position of 
it is absolutely necessary for me to be different from the way I am. But there's absolutely nothing I can do about it because being the way I am, I cannot be different from that. Let's say this, but we can put it in different ways. I know that I ought not to be selfish. And I would very much like to be an unselfish person. But the reason why I want to be an unselfish person is that I am very selfish and would far more love myself and respect myself if I were unselfish. You see? I know that I ought to love God. And uh, whatever. And why do you want to love God? Well, because... God is the biggest boss and it's best to be on the side of the big battalions. <laughs> That's really why I want to do it. In other words, because I'm looking for the safety of my own spiritual skin. So I think I'll love God. Oh, sophisticated saints have known this. St. Paul understood it, St. Augustine understood it, Martin Luther understood it. They didn't know what the hell to do about it. But there was nothing to do about it. And yet something has to be done. Obviously. But you realize when you really look into yourself, there's nothing you can do. And this, therefore, is our point of departure. That we here... perhaps, perhaps not, mutually realize there is nothing we can do to be anything else than what we are. To feel any other way than what we feel at this moment. And to be then this quaking mess which has the capacity for the horrors about what life can do to us. However, this isn't as much of a blind alley, a cul-de-sac, as it sounds. Because if you discover a blind alley, it tells you something. Watch the flow of water when it crosses over an area of land. And you will see that it puts out fingers. And some of them stop because they come into blind alleys. And the water doesn't pursue that course. It simply rises. And then it finds a way it can go. But it never uses any effort. It only uses weight, gravity. It takes the line of least resistance and eventually finds a course. Now we will do the same thing. Only we're ashamed of it. But we're going to do it anyhow. We think that when we come to a dead end, a blind alley, oh, I failed. Supposing the water, at each place where a finger of water stretches out over dry ground and doesn't go any further because the land is too high, the water were to say to itself, I failed. We would say it was neurotic water. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait, and it will find a way. Now, when you find, you see, that there's, there's this predicament that I've been describing to you, that there's no way of transforming yourself to become this fearless, joyous, divine being as distinct from the quaking mass. When you says no way, this is not a gloomy announcement.
It is a very, very important communication. It's telling you something. Because the, like the land is telling the water, this isn't the way to go. There's another way. Try over here. So in the same way, life is telling you that's not the way to go. It's telling you the, the, the message underlying this is you cannot transform yourself is giving you the message that the you that you imagine to be capable of transforming yourself doesn't exist. In other words, an ego, an I, separate from my emotions, my thoughts, my feelings, my experiences, who is supposed to be in control of them, cannot control them because it isn't there. And as soon as you understand that, things will be vastly improved. Now, we can go into this. What do you mean by the word I? We're going to make some experiments in this on some number of different levels, but in the ordinary way, what do you mean by the word I? I myself. Your personality, your ego, what is it? Well, first of all, obviously, it's your image of yourself. It's composed of what people have told you about yourself, who you are, how they've reacted to you and given you an impression that that's the sort of person you are. It's all your education goes into this, the style of life you put on and so forth. But, you, but it's an image, it's an idea, it's your thought about yourself and I suppose yourself is in fact not this, but is to begin with, your total physical organism, your psychological organism, and beyond that, an organism doesn't exist as a, an isolated thing any more than a flower exists without a stalk, without roots, without earth. So in the same way, although we are not stalked on the ground, we are nevertheless inseparable from a huge social context of, well, to begin with, parents, siblings, people who work for us and everything. I mean, it's, it's just impossible to cut ourselves off from a social environment and also, furthermore, from a natural environment. We are that. There's no clear way of drawing the boundary between this organism and everything that surrounds it. And yet, the image of ourselves that we have does not include all those relationships. Our idea of personality of ourselves includes no information whatsoever about the hypothalamus, an organ of the brain, the pineal gland, really of the way we breathe of how our blood circulates, of how we manage to form a sentence, how we manage to be conscious, how you open and close your hand. The information contained in your image of yourself contains nothing about all that. And therefore, obviously, it's an extremely inadequate image. But nonetheless, we do think that the image of self refers to something. Because we, we have the impression, very strongly indeed, that I exist. And this isn't just an idea we think, my God, it's a feeling. It's, it's really substantially there in the middle of us. And what is it? 
what, what, what do you actually sense? Like, you know, when you're sitting on the floor and you feel the floor is there and is real and hard. Okay, what are you sitting on the floor? What, are, what do you have the sensation of? You know, that's you here when you're not hitting yourself. Huh. What is it? Well, in what part of your body do you feel yourself, the real I existing? We can explore this very deeply, but I'm going to give you a preliminary and superficial answer. The, the sensation which corresponds to the image of ourselves is a chronic muscular tension. Which has absolutely no useful function whatsoever. It is when you try, say, to concentrate. What do you do when you try to pay attention? When I was a little boy in school, I had sitting next to me another boy who had great difficulty in reading. And as he worked over the textbook with its perfectly piffling information, he groaned and grunted to try to read, to get out the sounds, as if he were heaving enormous weights with his muscles. You know, spot, bra, uh, uh, run, uh, uh, spot. A spot er, on. You know? <laughs> His enormous weights he was heaving. And, you know, the teacher was vaguely impressed that he was trying. Phew! <laughs> <laughs> it had absolutely, you know, all this tying yourself up into a knot has absolutely nothing to do with the way your mind works. Because, look, if you try to see hard, you know, look very intensely, and you make tight muscles around here, and maybe you clench your jaws a bit, if anything, that will make your vision more fuzzy. Because if you want to see something clearly, you must not make an effort. You must simply trust your eyes and your nervous system to do their thing. So you just look like that. I was writing the other night and I completely forgot somebody's name. But I knew that eventually my memory would produce it. And I just sat for a while and said to my memory, you know very well who this person is. Please give me the answer. And so, boing, there it was. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the way nerves work. They don't work by forcing them. And yet we've all been brought up to try to force our nervous activity, our concentration, our memory, our comprehension, and indeed our very love. We've tried to fight it the same way. Well, let, let's complete the picture. So therefore, the, the notion that we have of ourselves, of ego, is a compound of an image of ourselves which does not fit the facts, and a sensation of muscular straining which is futile. So that what you conceive to be yourself is the marriage of an illusion and a futility. <laughs> So, well, what are we, if that isn't the case? Well, obviously, uh, if you 
want to take a scientific point of view by that mythology, then your, your organism, about which we know very little, and the organism, as we've seen, is inseparable from its environment, and so you are the organism environment. In other words, you are no less than the universe. Each one of you is the universe expressed in the place which you feel is here and now. You're an aperture through which the universe is looking at itself, exploring itself. And we're going to go into that much more deeply. So when you feel that you are a lonely put upon isolated little stranger confronting all this see you have an illusory feeling because the truth is the reverse you are the whole works that there is that always was and always has been always will be only just as my whole body has a little nerve end here which is exploring and which contributes to the sense of touch. You are just such a little nerve end for everything that's going on. Just as the eyes serve the whole body and help it to find its way around, so you are, as it were, serving the whole universe. You're a cell in it. and it's exploring itself. So that you as a function, you, you are a function of all that. And therefore, if this is so, it just doesn't fit the, f the... These facts do not fit the way we feel. Because we feel it the other way around. I am a little lonely thing exploring all this universe and trying to get make something out of it, get something out of it, do something with it. And I know I'm going to fail because I know I'm going to die one day. So we're all fundamentally depressed. And think up all these fantasies about what's going to happen to us when we're dead and all that kind of thing. Uh, what's going to happen to you when you're dead? What do you mean, you? If you are basically the universe, that question is irrelevant. You never were born and you never will die. Because what there is, is you. And that should be absolutely obvious. But it is not obvious at all. That should be the simplest thing in the world. That you, the I, is what has always been going on and always will go on forever and ever. But we have been bamboozled by religionists, by politicians, by fathers and mothers, by all sorts of people to tell us, you're not it. And we believed it. So, do you see now why, if I put it to you in this very negative way, you can't do anything to change yourselves, to become better, to become happier, to become more serene, to become mystics or anything. If I say you can't do a damn thing, can you understand this negative statement in a positive way? What I'm really saying is that you don't need to. Because if you see yourselves in the correct way, you are all as much extraordinary phenomena of nature as, say, trees, clouds, the patterns in running water, the shape of fire, the arrangement of the stars, the form of a galaxy. You are all just like that.
There's nothing wrong with you at all. Except that I have to add this little flip. You, you, you have in you, you do think there's something wrong with you. See? And there's no question, you do. We all object to ourselves in various ways. And I'm going to add, there's nothing wrong with that either. Because that's part of the flow. That's part of what is going on. That's part of what we do. So I don't, you see, I'm, 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 what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to deliver you from a sense of guilt. Because I'm going to teach you that you needn't feel guilty because you feel guilty. <laughs> of course you feel guilty. It's like someone put a match on you and you feel hot. So they taught you as a child to feel guilty and you feel guilty. They say, well, if someone comes along and says, well, you shouldn't. That's not the point. I'm going to say, not that you shouldn't, but that you do and don't worry about it. <laughs> and if you want to say further, but I can't help worrying about it, I'm going to say to you, okay, worry about it. <laughs> this is the principle called in Japanese judo, meaning the gentle way. Go along with it. Go along with it. Go along with it. So therefore, this is the beginning of meditation. You don't know what you're supposed to do. What can you do? Well, if you don't know what you're supposed to do, you watch. You simply watch what's going on. Like, say, somebody plays music. You listen, and you just follow those sounds. And eventually, you understand the point of the music. The point cannot be explained in words, because music is not words. But after a while, in listening to any music, you will understand the point of it. And that point will be the music itself. So in exactly the same way, you can listen to all experiences, because all experiences whatsoever are vibrations coming at you. Well, they, you are these vibrations, as a matter of fact. If you really feel out what is happening, what you are aware of as you and as everything else is all the same. It's a, 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 a vibrations of all kinds, and they're on different bands of a spectrum. Sight vibrations, emotion vibrations, uh, touch vibrations, sound vibrations, all these things adding together are woven. It, it, all the different senses are woven, and you get a pattern in the weaving, and that pattern is the picture of what you now feel. And this thing is going, see? Now, instead of saying, what should I do about it? Because who knows what to do about it? To know what to do about this, you would have to know everything. And if you don't, then the only thing, that, at least to begin with, to begin with, you can do is watch. Watch what's going on. Watch not only what's going on on the outside, but also what's going on on the inside. Treat your own thoughts, your own reactions, your own emotions about what's going on outside as if those inside reactions were also outside things. That you're just watching. And follow simply observe how they go. Note now, you may say, this is difficult. I am bored by watching what is going on. Let's say you, you, you sit quite still 
and you are simply observing what is happening. All the sounds outside, all the different shapes and lights in front of your eyes, all the feelings on your skin, inside your skin, belly rumbles, thoughts going on inside your head, chatter, chatter, chatter. I ought to be writing a letter to so-and-so. I should have done this, this, that all this bilge going on. See, you just watch it. But then you say to yourself, but this is boring. <coughs> now, watch that too. What is it? What, what kind of a funny feeling is it that makes you say, but this is boring? <coughs> Where is it? Where do you feel it? I should be doing something else instead. What's that feeling? What part of your body is it in? Is it in here? Is it in here? Is it in the soles of your feet? Where is it? Boring. The feeling of boredom can be very interesting if you try to look it out. So you simply watch at everything going on without attempting to change it in any way, without judging it, without calling it good or bad, you watch it. And that is the essential process of meditation.